Hey Doc, it's Nick. This is a case you had sent me uh, where you're about ready to <clears throat> start helping the patient on the lower arch. Um, just to show where you started, um, this patient presented with uh, rather significant decay that uh, this particular Itero scan doesn't necessarily show. Uh, but you had started this case three years ago and here's where you are now. So you had removed all the teeth that needed to be removed and you've crowned um, at least some of the teeth in the upper arch. Now the patient's ready to start with the lower arch. Uh, you also have a partial on the upper, which is uh, serving the patient well. Uh, <clears throat> as you indicated, the patient has pretty poor oral hygiene here, uh, generalized gingival swelling due to lack of home care. <clears throat> uh, this, is a, this is always tough. I know dental schools are uh, notorious for saying something to the effect of never treat a patient that doesn't take care of their teeth. Um, every clinician resolves this their own way, but my personal experience is <clears throat> for every patient that doesn't take care of their teeth after you do some significant work, there's nine or eight or nine people that upgrade their, their home care because you've given them a, a new lease on life or you've hit the reset button for them. Uh, so I think it's always important that we not judge the, the patient, we educate them, we enforce that education, and we try to get them to the finish line. So I wouldn't lose a whole lot of sleep over this. At the end of the day, the patient's not taking care of things. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, how this will affect the patient's care moving forward is something you're gonna have to resolve with the patient. But let's just say that the home care wasn't an issue. How do we proceed? So here you want to uh, start the lower arch, and as you identified, you may or may not want to open the bite here. So first things first, when we open the bite, do we have a stable joint? Do we have a stable um, musculature or neuromusculature? How do we know these things? Uh, topic for another day. But I think the first thing we always want to ask when we open verticals is, is the patient's uh, joint and muscles healthy? I think where the fear of opening the bite comes from, comes from clinicians historically who open the bite in patients with unstable uh, joints and muscles, then had problems down the road. Much of the time, opening the bite actually helps those things. So. Uh, a lot of times that is the actual treatment. But I think having some clarity in that before you, you start would help prevent any sort of unfortunate outcomes. So, how do we open the bite here? Well, there's two major ways of capturing the information necessary that the lab can open the bite accordingly. The first is with a face bow and then a a set of bite records in MIP, and then you ask the lab to open accordingly. Why is a face bow important? A face bow is important because the lower jaw does not open pure vertically in relation to the upper arch. What do I mean? There's a rotation of access at the joint. That rotation of access means one millimeter of opening in the front is not one millimeter out back. It'd be less out back because it's closer to the rotation of access or the hinge point. If our mouths opened purely vertically, for every millimeter out back, there would be a millimeter in the front, we would not need a face bow for the purposes of opening the bite. Face bows have other purposes, but I'm just saying as far as opening the bite, the face bow's purpose is to give the lab the rotation of access for that patient. Yes, there are averages, and yes, it's correct that a face bow does not exactly uh, indicate the rotation of access because the face bow <clears throat> sits in the ear canal which only approximates the location of the joint. With that said, it's better than nothing. So one method of opening the bite is to take bite records with a face bow and have the lab open it, open it, uh, the bite on an articulator that matches your face bow. The second method is to capture the jaw relation at an open vertical position that you like in the patient's mouth. There are, although that might sound more accurate, you're, you're fighting the patient's musculature and potentially aberrant neuromusculature and uh, deranged joint as they open. 
what do I mean by that? When they open, if they're in a state of disharmony, the arc at which they open may not be a healthy arc of opening. In other words, it might not be in a position that you want to restore them. So there are labs that require, before opening the bite, three months of wearing a uh, orthotic and confirmation of a stable joint. That really is the right answer. And I would imagine that many prosthodontists uh, embark on these journeys accordingly. Is this patient going to wear a splint and to deprogram? I, I don't know if that patient needs this. So the more common method, and I'm not saying this is better, but how most clinicians that dabble in this world operate is the following. You have the patient open it during, um, during the bite records. How far do you open them? Uh, one method is to open them so that their shimbashi, which is a measurement from the lower CEJ to the upper CEJ, is somewhere between 17 and 18.5 millimeters. The shimbashi measurement comes out of the world of neuromuscular dentistry. Um, it's just a way to open the bite and have some sort of idea where you should put them vertically. Uh, I also like the phonetic bite for this purpose. I find the phonetic bite helps to account for the airway because we use our airway to speak when we're using phonetics. Our jaw position is, in theory, optimized vertically and horizontally based upon the maximum airflow when we speak. That's the, uh, the concept of the phonetic bite. So I, I use a variety of these. The point is, you want to have the patient captured vertically during the jaw relation, during the bite. So just a, a bite registration at an open vertical position. Well, how do you get them there? Well. What do we do in complete dentures? We use wax rims. So I will sometimes use soft wax and I will place it between the teeth to approximate a good position at which I'm happy. Uh, you have to use somewhat soft wax for this to happen, but the wax has to be hard enough that you, uh, you don't have the patient move the vertical position while you're capturing the bite because the wax was too soft. So we have this wax in the office. Uh, please let me know and I'll, I'll show you which one it is. So essentially, I find that position and I put some wax somewhere to stabilize the occlusion. What I'm doing is I'm providing a vertical occlusal stop. I say vertical, vertical and horizontal occlusal stop so that I've captured the mandible in the three-dimensional position at which I want them to restore the lower dentition with the wax up. What would I do here? <clears throat> Uh, it looks like the patient might be, that might be 16 millimeters. I would get a piece of wax that gets this patient open to 18 millimeters, maybe even 18 and a half, and then inject the bite material all the way out back. All right. Maybe one could say you need a wax rim for all of the edentulous areas here. Uh, I don't think that's a bad idea. The wax rims will help ensure that the accuracy of the bite material uh, during the bite registration is where it needs to be. As you inject, make sure that you get as far back as you can. You want to have bite material that indicates the anterior posterior position of both the upper and lower arch all the way, all the way around. So basically you want to have bite material from at least the first molar region all the way around. Uh, if you don't get that, then the lab may not be accurately mounting the case because the posterior section might wobble. This is getting a little better now that we're using digital dentistry. Uh, with that said, you want to make sure you capture as much as you can. Uh, I would ask the lab what they, what, what they think about using wax rims here. The term used in dentistry for capturing a bite in an edentulous area like this. It's called a smush bite. I don't know if that's an official term, but um, I've heard it used by lab technicians. Smush bite or mash bite. Uh, I'm not sure if it's as accurate as using a wax rim. I've used it many times and haven't had any issues, but something to think about. So the goal here is to get a wax up done at an open vertical. Then you bring the patient back, and what you'll do is you'll prep the teeth, temporize them, 
you can get the final impression of the preps, but you're not going to um, do the jar relation. And the reason for that is you want the patient to live in the temporaries for a period of time. And as time goes on, you may or may not be adjusting the occlusion to the patient's comfort. Let's say you give it six to eight weeks, then the patient comes back. You don't need to numb them. You just pop off, say, uh, these two temporaries here. The vertical is maintained with the temporaries here, and you inject bite material between number nine and, say, these two teeth here. Once that sets, you then take off the other temporaries. The vertical is then maintained by that initial bite that you took between the lower preps and the upper crown. And then you inject all of the rest of the bite material all the way across, which captures that patient's three-dimensional position that they have confirmed to be comfortable for them over a six to eight, peri six to eight week period of time. That's typically how I do it, and I've had a high degree of success. If I have a patient that has joint issues, I definitely deal with the joint before I start on this journey. So I'm hoping this helps. Uh, there are many, many, many theories on how to go about this. I have no doubt that many of the things that I said would be considered heresy in some occlusal camps. Uh, with that said, there are many ways of treating our patients. And a patient of this kind, I think using the temporaries to confirm the vertical position uh, might be the way to go uh, without overcomplicating it. With that said, you should know how to use a face bow. You should know why we use a face bow. Face bows are not meant just for horizontal planes, um, although that is one of the reasons. It's really helpful in creating a rotation of access so that as the lab modifies the uh, vertical dimension, it's done around uh, a rotation of access. So I hope you have a good weekend and hopefully this provided some insight to help you with this case. Take care.